hearts, not words. That was our cry. That day, in 1909, we suffragettes were marching to Parliament to demand the vote for women. That women, as well as men, should be allowed to vote in electing our government. Our Prime Minister, Mr Asquith, had promised it should be so. But now he'd had second thoughts. He feared that too many women might vote against his party and bring his government down. So he did precisely nothing. Deeds, not words. Deeds, not words. That cry of ours meant two things. Instead of mere promises that the vote would be given to women, we wanted the government to do as they'd said. And if they wouldn't, then we were willing to act as well as speak in protest. We'd come from our meeting in a nearby hall, and the words we'd heard from our movement's leader, Mrs. Pankhurst, were still ringing in my ears. We shall be marching to Parliament, not as lawbreakers, but because women should be lawmakers. My name is Constance Lytton. My full name is Lady Constance Bulwer-Lytton. Some people thought it strange that I, from a family of the ruling class, should ever have been a part of such a crowd. But Mrs. Pankhurst was a well-born lady too, and listened to what she said next. A society that allows women no part in decision-making cannot flourish. Beyond the home, what lives are we permitted? Important posts are barred to us in all professions. Posts in government are just for men. Yet all their decisions affect women. They must either do us justice by giving us the vote or do us violence. When we reached the Houses of Parliament, lines of policemen barred our march. Some women broke through and chained themselves to the railings by the entrance. Meanwhile, I was still outside, wedged by the crowd behind me, nose to nose with a policeman. Back! Back! Keep back! I'm only doing my duty. Yes, and we are doing ours. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Go home, the lot of you, and behave like women. Like women? Yeah! Get home and do the washing! I must see Mr. Asquith. I mean to see the Prime Minister. I don't think so. You're coming with me! <sighs> and I was marched to the nearest police station, and from there to court, where I was sentenced to a month's imprisonment. And it was there, in Holloway Prison, that I truly realized why our cause was so important, why women had to be allowed to vote to change things. For now, I was mixing with women whose lives we could improve. Women without money for their children's food. And even if they found work, their pay was half that of a man's. I remember on my very first night, the prison chaplain came to my cell. I'm surprised that a lady of your class feels the need to interfere in politics. I am a woman. What women face in life is not understood by men. Yet men are the only lawmakers. So they are. Uh, so women's concerns are always put to one side, forgotten. Uh, I didn't come here to discuss your views. Here. I'm told you may have these. What? Letters from my family? Indeed. But prisoners are not allowed to have them. Oh, I think we can make an exception in your case, my lady. I want no privilege. You prefer to stay in all this stink. Stink. Yes, that is the right word. There's no air in here. Indeed, there isn't. How will you bear it, my lady? I'm not sure I will. And we're condemned to this, merely for demanding the vote. Votes for women! Votes for women! But I have a confession. Because I have a heart condition, I gave in. I finally accepted the offer and spent most of my month out of the stink and in the prison hospital. 
I was ashamed of myself. I decided that as soon as I was released, I'd be marching with the suffragettes again. And if it landed me in prison a second time, I'd make sure I was offered no special treatment. I would suffer whatever the others suffered. For I would go not as Lady Lytton, but as an ordinary working woman. My treatment so far had been bad enough. But worse, much worse, was to come. As Lady Constance Lytton, with influential friends, I'd been given special treatment in prison. Would I be treated differently if I changed my appearance and my name? I decided I would join the suffragettes' next march of protest, disguised as an ordinary working woman, a woman by the name of Jane Wharton. I went to buy a pair of glasses and the plainest, least fashionable dress and coat and hat and had my hair cut short. I could tell my ugly disguise was a success. You know, ladies, I think she's actually bought that hat. <laughs> I felt embarrassed as well as pleased by my disguise. But this was nothing compared to what my fellow suffragettes were going through in prison. Many were now on hunger strike, refusing to take food, and being forced to eat in the cruelest way. So I travelled by train up to Liverpool to join the protest outside the prison, where we knew this cruel treatment was in force. In front of the prison governor's house, Miss Emily Davison spoke to the assembled crowd. If there are no men in Liverpool who stand up for these prisoners here... Let the women do their part. Stay and blockade the governor's house till the prisoners are released. Two policemen seemed to have their eyes fixed on me. I was determined to get arrested and imprisoned. So I began to throw the stones I was holding. Though I didn't throw them at the governor's windows, all I did was drop them over the hedge into his garden. But that was enough. Right, that's it. The two policemen grabbed me by the arms and marched me off to the station. Miss Davison struck one of them on the back. Let her go! She's done nothing! Let her go, I say! So she was arrested too. I was sentenced to 14 days hard labour. And thanks to my disguise, Jane Wharton, as I now was, received none of the special treatment that had been offered to Lady Lytton. Now I learned exactly what my fellow suffragettes were subjected to. Each day, a wardress brought me all my meals. But as each meal was brought to my cell... I don't want any, thank you. Very well. Then, on the fourth day, a doctor entered my cell with five wardresses. So then. This one's Jane Wharton. Jane Wharton. And this is your fourth day without food? You must be fed at once. But I would urge you to take food willingly. You'll find it much more pleasant. When our government gives votes to women, I shall eat. Oh, this is absurd behaviour, all started by that Dunlop woman. Miss Wallace Dunlop began the hunger strikes, and all imprisoned suffragettes now follow her example. Very well. Let's lie her down on her bed. Oh. Come on. <coughs> Why must Keep you still. women resist? This is no way to help your cause. <coughs> then he thrust a tube down my throat. I choked as it reached inside. Down and down it went. Then the sloppy liquid food was poured in. It made me sick in seconds. It seemed an eternity before they took the tube out. I knew that Lady Constance Lytton would not have been treated like this. But ordinary Jane Wharton was a despised, helpless creature. And when she was out of prison, no one would believe a word she said. There were so many Jane Whartons in our land. We had to help them. 
by winning votes for women. Before long, through the wall, I heard the sounds of forced feeding in the cell next to mine. It was almost more than I could bear. But at last, the ghastly process was over, and all was quiet. Then I tapped on the wall, and called out, No surrender. Votes for women. And there came an answer from beyond the wall. No surrender. Votes for women. I think it was Miss Davison. I couldn't be sure. But now, as I think back, I am quite sure of her most famous deed. On the 4th of June, 1913, Emily Davison was at the front of the crowd of the Epsom Derby. With the horse race in full flow, she stepped under the barrier and onto the track. Two horses thundered past her, but as another, the King's horse, galloped round the bend, she lunged towards it and was bowled over and trampled under its hooves. <laughs> Some said it was suicide, to bring attention to our cause. But Emily had bought a return ticket to the race. I believe that she had no intention of dying as she did. I believe that she was trying to hang a suffragette flag on the passing horse, so that when it crossed the finishing line, the king's own horse would be flying the slogan, Votes for Women. Perhaps it was a turning point. I don't know. It had taken years. But in 1918, women were given the vote. If they were over 30. Perhaps in time, women will have the vote on the same terms as men. Perhaps one day, they will even be elected themselves. I hope for this, at least. That anyone in future times who has the right to vote will use it and will remember the struggles of the suffragettes. Deeds, not words. Deeds, not words. Deeds, not words.